What does Paul say before the council? That's what we're going to talk about today in Acts 23. Wow. So now the council's all there, and Paul is standing before them, tries to give a defense. The chief priests, the council, all there, Paul is brought and set before them. And he's telling them, look, I lived my whole life with God into good conscience right up till today. And the high priest said that Ananias commanded those who stood by Paul to hit him, hit him in the mouth. Paul said, you know, God is going to strike you, you white washed walls, you know, meaning you're, ju- you're just clean on the outside. He tried to start out nice by calling them all brothers. And so the whitewashed walls means that, you know, you're a hypocrite. You're just cleaning the outside, you're, but your insides are bad. Ananias was famous. He was the first one in the Bible where they found his crypt. And it was pretty clearly a, a crypt of someone who was very high up there. It was very decorated. But Ananias was a high priest from 47 to 59. And he had a bad reputation of being violent. And in 66 AD, because we remember in 70 AD, all these bad things happened. And so then there was a revolt that broke out in 66 AD. Ananias was assassinated by Daggermen, that Sakari, right? He was that well liked. He ran the Sanhedrin as he wished it would be. And I think, again, he was going to be the son of the person who ran it during the other Herods. So this was a family deal. But Ananias was having none of it, had him be struck. And so Paul says this thing to him, and people are like, how dare you insult the God's high priest? This is going to be the high priest of the temple. And so then Paul says, quote, I didn't know, brothers, that he was the high priest because it was written, you shall not speak evil of the ruler of your people, right? We are told to respect our leaders. Now, was he saying that because he really didn't know who Ananias was? So there's all sorts of theories. Theory one, he didn't know who it was because Paul's eyesight was so bad. We know that Paul had people write his letters for him because his eyesight was terrible. It was possible he didn't see or know who struck him. Or the other suggestion was clearly the high priest of God wouldn't cause violence against another man, would he? I didn't know it was him because, oh, the high priest wouldn't do such a thing. So either it was sarcastic or it was genuine. We don't know. So that's something, again, to ask when we get into heaven. So Paul said that he understood that the Sadducees, those who don't believe in the prophets, but just the law, and then the Pharisees were both there in that room. And he's like, look, brothers, I am a Pharisee. I'm a son of a Pharisee. It is with respect and hope for the resurrection to come of the dead. And is that why you're putting me on trial? Because I believe in the resurrection? Sort of these guys here, they all believe in the resurrection. He's doing it to sort of putting that split line right between them. They can get along. They can be on the Sanhedrin together. They can sort of rule Jerusalem together, even though the Sadducees had the most power. But he knew that dividing line between them. That was going to be the thing that caused division among them because the Sadducees didn't believe in the resurrection. So he was using this as kind of a a way uh, to throw one group of people for him and the other group of people who are already against him anyway. But if I'm being put on trial because I believe in the resurrection and that I believe, and we, we haven't gotten to this point yet, but that Jesus was the first who was resurrected, that he is the resurrection hope for us all. We didn't get to that part yet. But he said that this caused dissension, divided the group, and clamor arose between them. And some of the scribes of the Pharisees stood up, and then they were like, nothing's wrong with this guy. He just believes in the resurrection. You know, what if an angel or spirit spoke to him? Are you saying that it's not possible? But of course, the Sadducees were like, yeah, that's not possible because there's no angels, no spirits, no resurrection. So now they're fighting with each other instead of fighting with Paul. And it became so violent that they were afraid it said that Paul would get torn to pieces. So they commanded the soldiers to go down and take him away and bring him out and bring him into the barracks of the Tower of Antonia. That is where the barracks were. That's where there was a kind of small jail that was there. And the following night, the Lord, it says, stood by him and said in red letters, take courage. 
as you have testified to the facts about me in Jerusalem, you must testify in Rome. So Paul knew nothing's really going to happen to him. He has to go to Rome first. I mean, maybe something's going to happen to him in Rome, but right now, nothing's going to happen to him. He knows his fate is not to end his life here. So he had reason to be encouraged, but he also had reason to then be bold. So then it said that there were a plot among the Jews and they bound themselves in an oath that they weren't going to eat or drink anything until they killed Paul. Forty people, more than 40 people, made this conspiracy. They went to the chief priests and the elders and said, we've bound ourselves to do this. We're going to kill Paul. So go have Paul brought down because then we'll be able to kill him when he comes near. And it says, this is fun. The son of Paul's sister heard about the ambush. So now we know that Paul has a sister and that Paul's sister has a son. This also leads people to believe, too, that Paul at one point was married. And the reason that they believe that is because he was so high up in the temple structure before he became a Christian that only married men could be put into that high position. We, we don't know much about anything that's Paul's life. But this is kind of interesting that his, his sister has a son. So the son of Paul's sister went to the barracks and told Paul, and Paul told one of the centurions and said, could you take this man to the tribune? He has something to say to him. Told him about the whole conspiracy and told him what was going to happen and begged him, don't, don't do this thing because there's going to be more than 40 men who are lying in ambush and are going to wait to kill him because they swore an oath. So the tribune uh, dismissed the young man and say, you don't tell anyone about this. He took this seriously. And so it said that he assigned 470 men to guard this Roman citizen, Paul. Wow. He had seen what had happened, how a mob tried to kill him. I mean, this guy has protected Paul in every opportunity. It's really good. Now he's going to take extra precautions to protect him also. So he called the centurion, got 200 soldiers with 70 horsemen, 200 spearmen to go as far as Caesarea in the third hour of the night. That's going to be 9 p.m. and provide a mount, you know, get him a horse and ride him safely to Felix the governor. The tribune wrote a letter, Claudius Lysias, to the excellency, the governor Felix. I like all this hoity-toity language readings and said this man was nearly seized they tried to kill him there's a big conspiracy but he's a roman citizen and knowing that the charges that they were accusing him of i found that he didn't deserve death so it was disclosed to me there's a big plot and so i'm sending him to you to Caesarea, so that he can be protected against his accusers soldiers did everything that they were told to do brought paul by night and the next day returned to the barracks and letting the horsemen go with him. And so then the next day they returned to the barrack. When Paul came to Caesarea and delivered this letter to the governor, presented Paul before it and reading it, he asked him, where are you from? I, I will give you a hearing when your accusers arrive. But he, basically he's under protection and he was guarded by Herod's praetorium. This is going to be Herod's private guard. So he's safe for now. What I'm going to meditate on is this constant plot to kill Paul. Good ideas can stand debate, right? They should have been able to debate this point. There should have been no anger. We should have talked about this. Like I said, the, the Sanhedrin and the Jewish structure thought that when they killed Jesus, this was over. This was going to end. And then they tried to kill Peter. They killed James. Why can't we put this to an end? But in the end, they really should have been able to debate and talk about this. And like the group that Paul talked about where they brought the scriptures out and looked at the points. That's what people do when they have a good arguing point. To me, this makes it feel like they believed what Jesus was saying. They just didn't want it to be true. And so they didn't have a good defense again against it. They just wanted it to be true. And what I'm going to pray about is the fact that sometimes when people are arguing against you, they can't argue against you. So they're going to use anger and they're going to use the law and they're going to use every tool they have under their belt, dagger men of all things, to try to stop this message from going out. That, that is just a sure sign 
you're on the right track, that they have nothing to say to you. And what I'm going to tell other people is that exact thing about standing tall and understanding that a lot of times when people will try to combat you, maybe get you kicked off of a campus, maybe get you kicked out of a place where people are discussing ideas. I remember once I worked for a company and we were just having a quick Bible study to ourselves at lunch. So I forgot how many days a week, but we were going to get together, I think once a week in the company cafeteria, sit off in a corner by ourselves and have a Bible study. Someone must have overheard us and reported us to the owner of the company. And at that point, she banished any Bible studies from happening in any part of any offices, including the lunchroom. Can't people have lunch? I mean, I I know that there were other book studies going on. I know that there was a Satanist group that was going on. And there were some other types of political discussion groups going on. When someone tells you you can't even speak, boy, that's an indication they have nothing to say to you. All right, everyone, thanks so much. I appreciate you listening to the podcast. Please remember that you can listen to my other podcasts. I have Start With Small Steps, which is about making better use of our time, It's a productivity podcast. I don't think that this is where our bread is buttered in life, but wouldn't we live our own Christian lives better by making better use of our time? So Start With Small Steps is a whole podcast about trying to make things better. It's also published to YouTube. You can watch it there. It's not me on the video screen, but you can also look for Start With Small Steps on YouTube and you'll find the podcast there as well. Thanks so much for listening.